All right, good morning. Hope you all are doing well. Happy Wednesday, all that jazz. For those of you with a Friday lab, it, and for those of you with a Wednesday lab, just translate what I say into, into Wednesday instead of Friday. But for those of you with a Friday lab, uh, this week we'll take the first midterm exam, so we won't have problem set four, uh, we won't take a quiz, it'll be just the midterm. And then also do exam prep one worksheet, uh, the organic chemistry lab you'll turn into me. And then afterwards we do have a lab, it's the molar mass of a volatile liquid lab. Now it's kind of weird to have a lab after an exam. I totally understand. This is one of the cooler labs for what it's worth. And I do want you to bring safety goggles on this lab. All right, this is one we're gonna have flames, boiling water, all kinds of jazz, uh, pretty fun. So if you don't have some, I've absolutely got some you can borrow, no big deal. And then finally, today at two o'clock, there is supposedly gonna be a fire drill. Now, for most of you, it's no big deal, but uh, Emily and Kaylin, especially, yeah, uh, during your exam, man, uh, there's gonna be supposedly a fire drill. So we'll just walk out, leave your exam. You can take purses, calculators, computers, that kind of stuff with you. Uh, take that stuff with you, but leave the exam in the room. We'll walk out, do the drill, come back. Um, I'll add time to the exam time to compensate for it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. So, any questions? Today we're gonna to start something that won't be part of the first midterm, so just letting you know that. But this is gonna be the study of gases. And gases are really interesting. If I said, hey Clifford, look at my gas, and I open my hand, it's gone, right? So gases are hard to study because you have to contain them and all that kind of jazz. But amazingly, I argue that the formal study of chemistry started with gases. So we're gonna see some of the oldest kind of chemistry studies and stuff done here. Pretty cool kind of jazz. So let's talk about gases. <clears throat> My sister was in a bad accident one time and an airbag arguably saved her life or at least some very serious damage. And so airbags have become customary to have in cars. And most airbags, when they uh, are activated, nitrogen is added, making the big kind of balloon thing that pops up. Usually what happens is the gas is created from sodium azide. N3- is called the azide ion, it's kind of weird. But anyway, in the process, you end up with lots of gas and it expands. So the people that make cars need to know how much gas is created to create a buffer for you not hitting the door, door dash or whatever kind of things in front of you. Collision involving a car equipped with airbags. The impact initiates a chemical reaction. Automobile airbags work when a sample of sodium azide detonates producing nitrogen gas. This gas fills the bag. Using our understanding of the gas loss, we can calculate the quantity of sodium azide required to produce the appropriate amount of nitrogen gas. So this is one place where the study of gases is really helpful because you can figure out how much gas you need uh, based on what you start with and stuff, and that's what we'll be studying in this part. So we're back to the world of chemical reactions, and this is an example of it. The reactants are on the left, the products are on the right. The states of matter, um, which are not always included, but if they are, show solids, gases, liquids, and then of course sometimes aqueous. And the big numbers are called stoichiometric coefficients. They tell you how many moles of each are reacting, how many moles are being created, just like that. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. The kinetic molecular theory is the theory that scientists use to describe the differences between solids, liquids, and gases. And we talked about this briefly in Chem 221, and we're gonna basically start a series of chapters where we're gonna talk about it a lot more. But solids are basically very rigid, all right? They have a certain place, they do vibrate, but they don't move around as much. So if you have like a tube of some solid right here, it'll stay as a solid, it won't move around. 
Liquids, on the other hand, which I love these, these are all silly examples with a sheet, but I love it. Liquids will flow, all right, to whatever kind of thing. They don't have a fixed volume. They will have fixed mass, but the volume will change depending on the surrounding uh, areas. Uh, liquids are actually the hardest of the three phases to understand, and there's a lot of complex theories used to describe the behavior of liquids. But what we're going to focus on this chapter are the gases, all right? <clears throat> and gases are just random kind of atoms or molecules of the gas dispersed. Now, one thing that makes a gas different from liquids and solids is that these both have forces acting upon them. So like this little solid is connected to this little solid a little bit. And this little liquid is connected to that liquid. Now, it's not as strong over here as it is in the solids, but there is a type of force. And we'll look at that in the next chapter. But in gases, all the gases are just independent of each other, not a lot of interaction. So gases have a lot of free space in them. All right, I'm talking to all of you through a gas, all right? And you can see me and you can hear me, jazz like that, because gases, which were around all the time, have a lot of free space. If we were talking through liquids or solids, you may not be able to hear me at all, or it would sound kind of dwarfed. Uh, you can take a gas and expand it as much as you want. So earlier I said how, hey Clifford, I have a gas in my hand and I open it up and it's gone. That's because the gas is expanding, all right? But then as Chi opened the door just a little bit ago, maybe the gas would go outside. So it would continue to expand as much as you want and it could go into the universe and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> So whatever container your gas is in, the gas will, after a small amount of time, occupy it uniformly. Now you pour a liquid into a glass, the liquid of course goes to the bottom. But if you have a closed container, you pour your gas in, the gas is equally distributed around most parts and stuff. A little bit of a time delay, but not too much. And another really interesting thing is that gases will mix or diffuse quite readily. If you put liquids together, they may or may not mix well. We'll talk about that more in the next chapter. So for example, oil and water don't mix. Those would be examples of liquids that don't mix very well. But gases almost always mix really, really well with each other. So these are just differences between gases and the things that we're more used to, liquids and solids. Balloons, so if any of them pops, you may die. No, April, we would all die. Gases fill the volume of whatever container they're in. School. <laughs> so, totally <laughs> stupid. <laughs> all right, but uh, uh, science appears in the most strange ways. So, uh, yes, if you're ever in a crowded thing of balloons, uh, don't pop the balloons if one of them might have a poisonous gas. Enough said. Okay. We're back in the world of math when we talk about properties of gases. Now, the first three chapters we looked at, we didn't really talk about math hardly at all, all right? But now in this world, we are definitely back into it. And the amazing thing is that math will help you to describe gases amazingly well. Now, if you're talking about a gas, the factors that affect the gas will be the volume of the gas. And in Chemistry 222, we will usually use liters to represent the volume of a gas. The temperature is absolutely important. So just like we get more excited on warm days versus cold days, gases have that kind of familiarity too. We will use Kelvin temperatures to talk about the properties of gases. Uh, Celsius will go negative on us if we get below zero, and sometimes we don't want that. So Kelvin is the way to go, and of course, don't tell me anything about Fahrenheit, please. Uh, moles <clears throat> will represent the amount. If you have a little gas versus a lot of gas, you'll have, of course, different properties. So the moles of gas will be important to us. And the new player on the block, we've talked about these other three a little bit, but the new player is pressure. And pressure, <laughs> now, pressure is actually a phenomena that's associated with gases. And there's lots of types of units for gases, but atmospheres, ATM, is gonna be the type of pressure unit we're gonna use almost exclusively in this class. Now in physics, they'll use kilopascals and stuff like that, but in this class, we'll use atmospheres, ATM. <clears throat> 
what is pressure? Good question. Pressure was actually a phenomenon discovered a long time ago, 1643 in Italy. Torricelli was the scientist that found it. And Torricelli helped discover and develop what's now we call a barometer. And barometer is basically a little tube with a vacuum inside, and there's a pool of mercury on the bottom. And what pressure happens is that all around us all the time, we've got gases. And those gases, because of gravity basically, are pushing down on us. So gravity will push, will pull the, gas, the mercury down, and some of the mercury will go up the column, <clears throat> all right? But after a while, the gravity will start to pull the mercury down. So there is a finite place, if you will, that the mercury goes up. And this actually changes quite often, like it'll change hourly, even daily. Um, <clears throat> so the pressure of this system then is literally a measurement in centimeters or millimeters, something like that. And you can get a ruler out, you rule, you take a measurement from the bottom of the mercury to how high it goes. If you have what's called a standard atmosphere, which is more or less the pressure at the ocean, all right, um, it's called a standard atmosphere, and 760 millimeters of mercury would be the height of the column if you were at standard conditions. And we'll talk about all this here coming down. Um, we have an electronic barometer in 2506, the uh, balance room. So when we measure things in grams in that middle room, there's actually a barometer up there too. And we'll, I'll show you that this week in lab. I had like a so-so dick with Valerie. Now I'm number nine on the speed dump. So? So, I used to be seven. I dropped two spots. What, she's ranking you? Yeah, the speed dial is like a relationship barometer. What is a barometer exactly? It's pronounced thermometer. <laughs> okay, gases have a lot of fun things you could do with them, as you can tell. Of course, thermometers are used for measuring temperature, barometers are used for measuring pressure. So, anyway. I like Seinfeld a lot, I'm so sorry. Okay, back to pressure. So pressure, we have to have a way to describe it, all right? For example, this is a meter stick, all right? So a meter is what we use to measure length when we're talking about things in science. So in, in pressure, a standard atmosphere is more or less what the pressure is at the ocean. So if we went to seaside, road trip, then uh, roughly speaking, the pressure would be one atmosphere. So one atmosphere is described in several different ways. One of the ways we're gonna use a lot is how many millimeters of mercury that would represent on a barometer. So 760 millimeters of mercury, or 76 centimeters of mercury, is also equal to an atmosphere. So sometimes you'll have this kind of measurement made in lab, and you'll translate into an atmosphere. But there's more than that. So Torricelli is Tor, and a Tor is a millimeter of mercury. It's an alternate way to think about that. <clears throat> Just like Hertz was an inverse second, same thing. All right, a tor and a millimeter of mercury are the same. Sometimes people prefer one or the other, but they are the same. Now, in lab, our barometer uses what's called a millibar, all right? And chemists can't pass up a bar. Ba -bum -bum. Just say no. Seriously, a millibar is another kind of unit, all right? Pressure's been around for a long time, so there's lots of different ways to measure it. This one right here is gonna be important to us. <clears throat> 1,013 millibars are present in an atmosphere of pressure. So when you hear a millibar, <clears throat> it's really, uh, there's a thousand millibars in a bar. A bar you can see is a little bit greater than an atmosphere. Don't even get me started where these things pop out. But again, the important ones for us is that an atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury and 1013 millibars those are all equal to one atmosphere but there's more <clears throat> if you watch the news they'll a lot of times talk about measurements for pressure in inches of mercury and that's totally cool so you'll see sometimes well the barometer reading was blah. it'll be around 29.9 29.9 inches of mercury is equal to an atmosphere. So these are ones you might hear on a weather forecast. And 
Mercury, as you know, is not exactly the best chemical to use. So you could think about maybe using something like water, which is absolutely environmentally cool. But the problem is, is that water is a lot less dense than mercury. So if you're going to make a barometer with water, you have to have something that measures 34 feet high. All right. And at Dartmouth, they had one of these. It was in a big open area and it went up a couple stories, but you could get up and you could make the measurements for barometers with feet of water. Uh, it's very inconvenient. It's not something we could have like here in our classroom. On the other hand, if you do have one, smaller differentiations in pressures can become easier to monitor. So, oh. anyway, on top of all of this, the SI unit, the official unit of pressure, is called the Pascal, PA. And one atmosphere is 101.325 kilopascals. A kilopascal would equal a thousand pascals. So scientists, uh, chemists, let me rephrase that. Chemists almost always use atmospheres, and you'll see why here in a little bit. So just realize that if you're in other classes, you might see pressures listed as kilopascals or pascals, which are the official unit. But for whatever reason, chemists don't do that. So we're going to use in this class class, atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, which is the same as a tor, and in lab we'll use this millibar as well. These are all just different ways that people talk about pressure, just like there's feet and yards and inches and centimeters for length, all right? Same kind of thing, but this is just the pressure version. Okay, so this is the question you might see on a quiz, and if you want to do it with me, you can, or we can just walk talk about it. <clears throat> it says here that we've got a nitrogen gas with a pressure of 452 millimeters of mercury. And if I said, what is this pressure in atmospheres? Well, that's where you'd use this conversion right here. And there's 760 millimeters of mercury in an atmosphere. So you would, in your calculator, take 452, divide by 760, you'll get some number. That number comes out to be 0.595. So 0.595 atmospheres is the same as 452 millimeters of mercury. So again, in this chapter, we're back in the math, all right? All stuff you can do, all algebra. This is a conversion. We're starting with this. Our desired unit was atmospheres. Um, 760, we're gonna consider to be an exact conversion, just like 10 millimeters per centimeter. We didn't worry about sig figs. So when it comes to pressure, we'll look for sig figs in the initial unit to figure out what's going on. The initial zero is a placeholder. This is three sig figs from three sig figs. Prof that off. If anything I say is like, wah, 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 like peanuts, right? Uh, and you have questions, let me know. Cheap. So with our different units of pressure here, how we have the um, 760 milliliters, uh -huh. 76 centimeters, 100.1013 bars. You need um, to focus on 1,013 1, millibars and 760 millimeters of mercury. Are and, they all exact? Uh, I'm only going to use those as exact, all right. Um, the other ones, cheat. you should really see, there's a little controversy as to what's exact and not, so um, you should really talk to your instructor to be safe. <laughs> but for our class here, these are basically exact conversions. Okay, okay. good, excellent question. Cheese question is really good. Like you can have things that are exact, like 60 seconds per minute, but you can also have like hydrogen, 2.02 .02 grams per mole. And the 2.02 .02 is an experimental thing. So asking what's exact and not exact, very important. Okay. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> Pressure changes depending on what elevation you're at. So these are just some examples of how atmospheric pressure changes. So I said earlier how one atmosphere is roughly the pressure at sea level. Now, pressure is dictated by storms and heat and all kinds of other stuff, but if everything is neutral, more or less, then at sea level, you should have one atmosphere. 
But as you start to go up in elevation, then you begin to have less atmosphere. All right. So here's Denver, the mile high city, and you can see the pressure is less. If you went to this place in Bolivia, it's even less. And Mount Everest would be 0.35 atmospheres. So if you've ever seen like documentaries with people climbing Mount Everest, they usually have oxygen masks. That's to compensate for the lack of oxygen in the air. And some of these extreme people are like, I'm not going to use a mask. <laughs> wow, respect, man, because uh, that's pretty hardcore. Uh, but anyway, uh, people sometimes when you get to a mile high, even they begin to have problems breathing. And these people are super high up and stuff. So uh, anyway, good old Gresham, Oregon's official elevation, I think it's at City Hall, whatever, is 301 feet. So because we're higher than sea level, usually our pressure is a little less than one atmosphere. All right. And again, in lab this week, I can show you our barometer. It actually lists the pressure over the last seven days. It's kind of fun to watch how it goes up and down and stuff. Sometimes our pressure will be more than one atmosphere, but usually it's less. And again, the only reason it would be higher is if storms came in and stuff like that. So the first of the scientists to really hit the gas laws, his name was Boyle. <coughs> Excuse me. And Boyle uh, had an awesome wig, by the way. <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne. No, seriously. And what Boyle was looking at when he looked at uh, gases is he was looking at the relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume of a gas. All right. And in a nutshell, Boyle's law says that if the quantity N and the temperature T, we'll talk about what all these things mean later, if those are constant, then pressure times volume is always equal to a constant. So let's think about that. In this room right now, some kind of pressure times some type of volume of gas, it's going to be a constant. Well, if I increase the pressure, like add a lot more nitrogen or something like that, that's going to make the gas volume decrease. So pressure goes up, volume goes down. All right. And likewise, if I have a small gas in a container and I open it up to show Clifford for some reason, whoosh, the gas goes out, my small volume gets bigger, the pressure of that gas is going to go down. So the punchline of boil is that pressure and volume inversely proportional. All right. One goes up. The other one goes down, assuming all these other things that we'll talk about are constant. Yeah, but K is not a fixed constant. Correct. K will depend on a whole bunch of things and stuff. But if everything else is constant and only pressure and volume are changing, then Boyle's law is really well. Cool. <coughs> Excuse me. If it's a constant and you're not changing anything like Aiden said, then you can have one set of pressure volume conditions equaling a second set of pressure volume conditions. And in chemistry, that's usually seen as P1V1 equals P2V2. That's just saying that your initial, if you will, pressure and volume is going to be equal to the new pressure and the new volume when you multiply it together. <clears throat> your pressures and volume, of course, have to be in the same kind of units. And again, if you change the temperature or anything like that, then things get more. Pressure and volume are inversely related. Weight on the plunger of a sealed syringe increases the pressure on the air in the syringe. The air cannot escape, but its volume reduces under the pressure. In this example, they have a syringe, and to emulate a pressure, they're adding more metal to the top here. And as you have more mass, it pushes down on the syringe, so your pressure would be getting greater. So this is like a pressure unit, if you will. Even though it's mass, it's related to pressure. And this axis right here is one over the volume. And that might seem a little strange at first because we're measuring volume. <clears throat> but here's what happens when you measure pressure and volume. Uh, there's not a nice linear relationship. And people like to generally think about things as a linear thing. So you double it, you'll get twice as much. You triple it, you get three times as much, that kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> so that doesn't work very well. But if you take the inverse of one, <clears throat> excuse me, inverse of pressure or inverse of volume and plot it versus the other, then you get a nice straight line. 
So met scientists are able to predict the behavior of these gases by using pressure versus inverse volume or volume versus inverse pressure. And then you get a nice straight line, you can start doing math and stuff easier. Now, another great scientist in this area, his name was Charles. <clears throat> Charles was a balloonist at the time, and this is very relevant after the Chinese balloon went over <laughs> yet, but anyway, there's, the memes are hilarious. But anyway, prop that back on. Charles Law uh, was is one of the, what he ended up finding out while studying balloons, because of course, to make a balloon, you have to have gas to make it float and stuff like that. Anyway, in Charles' law, he saw that if you keep the pressure and the amount N constant, uh, and we'll talk about these in a little bit, then volume and temperature were proportional. So your temperature goes up and your volume goes up, and your temperature goes down and your volume goes down, uh, which is quite different. In the other one, pressure and volume, pressure went up and volume went down and vice versa. But here, volume and temperature actually proportional to each other. So a lot of times, Charles' law is represented as V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Now, this may seem strange that they're directly related, but remember, if volume goes up, temperature goes up, and vice versa, then temperature would be over here on this side. So because the constant is there, <clears throat> then you can get a good math relationship having V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Now, notice that temperature is in the denominator. If we were to use Celsius, Celsius goes to zero. What happens in math if you try to divide by zero? It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Your calculator spazzes. Any of these terms would be totally fine, all right? So because of this temperature and the denominator thing, we can't use Celsius, all right? A lot of times in the lab, like this week, we'll measure temperatures in Celsius, but then we'll convert to Kelvin because you can't have numbers divided by zero. Mathematically, it kind of freaks out. And again, in theory, at all our classes anyway, <clears throat> you'll never get to zero Kelvin. So Kelvin is just great because you'll always have a positive number and stuff. Temperature and volume are directly related. As heat is added to a sealed syringe, the volume of the air in the syringe increases. A plot of gas temperature and volume demonstrates that the relationship between them is linear. If we extrapolate the line down to a temperature of absolute zero, in principle, the gas has no volume. In this type of experiment, another syringe with gas inside, <clears throat> and they heat the water that the syringe is in. As you heat the gas inside, which is what the water will translate to it, then that pushes the syringe out. So your volume is going up as the temperature around it goes up. And it's a pretty nice linear relationship, which is cool. One thing that we'll talk about at the end of this chapter, though, is in theory, if you got down to zero Kelvin, all right, then in theory, your gas would have no volume. Now, how likely is it that you're going to have a gas with zero volume? Never. Yeah, not. All right, gases have mass, grams, all right? And grams will always have some kind of volume. They'll have a density, you can translate that into it. And it doesn't make sense that at zero Kelvin, you would have a gas with zero volume. So there's some weird things gonna happen down here. We'll talk briefly about them at the end of this quarter. Uh, end of this chapter, excuse me. Most of the time in chemistry, though, we're up in these regions, and this world law works really well. But we will talk about the limitations of the gas laws at the end of this chapter when we get to it. So. All right, <clears throat> there's lots of fun applications of Charles' law. If you've ever uh, seen a liquid nitrogen demonstration, you can take balloons and you can put them in the liquid nitrogen. They shrink way down because you're making that temperature go down, so the volume goes way down. They kind of shrink. So you pull it out of the liquid nitrogen, it's all compressed. Well, if you let it in the air for a while, it actually then warms back up. That volume goes back up and your balloon will like reinflate, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, liquid nitrogen is a fun thing to do, but anyway, this is a great example of Charles and things you can do with it. 
So <clears throat> here's an example of a kind of problem you might see. If you want to go through it with me with the math, you can, or on the other hand, we'll just kind of talk about it. Here we have a gas, 235 milliliters at 25 degrees Celsius. And the question is, at what temperature would the same gas have a volume of 310 milliliters? So this is one of those times where you want to use V1, T1 equals V2 over T2. And we're looking here for a temperature. So I would let that equal this one right here. <clears throat> Now, when you solve for a temperature like this, you've got to get it out of the denominator. You have to have the temperature in the upper part, the numerator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by T2, and that will cancel those out. And then you have T2 times V1 over T1 equals V2. But again, we want this one by itself. So I'm also going to multiply both sides by T1 over V1, all right? If you do something to one side, you can do it to the other. So the T1's cancel, the V1's cancel, and if you can see of all this, T2 equals V2 T1 over V1, all right? So the one thing I just want to remind everybody of is how you can solve for something like this in the denominator, all right? You need it in the numerator, and you essentially then multiply, cross things to get the T2 by itself in the numerator. So you end up flipping everything around. Questions on that process? Now, this is another time where I've got to point out that you've got to use Kelvin, all right? Now in this problem, the temperatures are in the numerator, but they can be in the denominator. So in this problem, which is kind of normal, your beginning temperature is Celsius and your answer is in Celsius. So in this problem, what you need to do, <coughs> what I would do, is I would first write V1, T1, and V2 on top of these things, because I need to know which is which, all right? A V2 is going to be 310. I'm going to put that there. The T1 we'll talk about would be this one, and then 235 would go in the bottom. But the other thing is we've got to convert Celsius into Kelvin. What is the magic number used to go from Celsius to Kelvin or vice versa? Is it 365? Close. 273. 273. Yeah. That's right. 365 is like days. Stuff like that. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I, uh, uh, Barnaby, you should have said that since you're not being recorded. No one knows who you are. <laughs> anyway, prop that back on. Yeah, 273.15 is the way to go from Celsius to Kelvin. So in this problem, start with 25, add 273, make it 298. And at the end, whatever volume you get out, reconvert it back into Celsius by subtracting. So in this problem, 25 plus 273 is 298. Uh, 310, oh, by the way, there's another thing. There's a little dot by it. Remember, if there's a dot by a zero, that means that's a significant number. So this is a three significant number. 310 with a dot would be like plus or minus one. 310 without a doubt, the one would be the last significant figure. It'd be like plus or minus 10. So three sig figs at the end, we end up with an answer 393 Kelvin. That's not 393 Celsius though. So you'd subtract 273 from it, 120 Celsius. Any questions? Cool. <clears throat> Avogadro's hypothesis, Avogadro of Avogadro's number, by the way, was another piece that helps out here. Now, N is the unit, is the symbol that's usually used for quantity, how much of the gas we have. And we will, of course, use moles. So N for us is going to be a term used for moles. And what Avogadro found is that if the pressure and the temperature are constant, we'll talk about R here in a little bit, then volume and moles are directly proportional. <clears throat> And this is kind of a cool thing. So here's two balloons, all right? Let's say that this balloon is exactly half of this balloon. Well, that means there's twice as many molecules in the, according to this, because if the quantity goes up, your volume goes up. And you can argue this would be one mole versus two mole, or half a mole versus one mole, some relationship like that. So you can actually make quantifications based on volume 
and relate it back to moles, which is kind of a neat thing. Now, <clears throat> this relationship is like what we just saw for temperature. This is a volume and moles now. So this is V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And again, N should be in moles, uh, and V would be the volume. Cool. Quantity and volume are directly related. If we take eight molecules of H2 and combine them with four molecules of O2, we get 12 molecules and a combined volume. If we then react the mixture, we end up with eight molecules of gaseous H2O, which occupies the same volume as eight molecules of any other gas. I like this example here because the size of the circles relate to the stoichiometric coefficients in the reaction. So again, stoichiometric coefficients are just these big numbers in front. There's like a one right there. And notice right here that this H2 circle should be twice as big as this one for the O2 because you have two moles versus one mole or eight molecules versus four molecules. Molecules and moles are proportional to each other. And then when they react, initially there was a much bigger circle because that would show that eight plus four, 12 molecules, it would have a lot more volume. But then once they react, they become eight molecules, in this case of water. <clears throat> this size and this size are the same because the molecules and moles will be proportional to each other. So volume will change as the uh, moles change, which is kind of interesting. But this also means that if you have one mole of a gas, the volumes will be the same regardless of what the gas is. And that's a really strange thing, but it does work really well for gases. So this would be four grams of helium, which is one mole of helium. And by the way, as a quick review, the red numbers under the elements, those are the molar masses. So helium is about four grams per mole. <clears throat> This is ammonia, NH3, 17 grams per mole. So 17 grams would be a mole, and O2, the diatomic, 32. But each of these are one mole, and each of them have the same volume, which is kind of interesting. Here's another example. This is helium. Uh, we have one mole of helium, and let's say the volume is equal to V. If you have two moles, you've doubled the moles, you will double the volume, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> this works really well for volume and temperature. It also works for pressure and uh, pressure and moles too. Uh, volume and moles, excuse me, versus pressure and moles. It's really interesting how this thing, quantity affects gases quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Questions on that? So this leads us into the best of the laws. A bicycle pump forces air into the confined space of the tire. As more air is added to the tire, the pressure increases. The tire's volume increases slightly, and the air becomes warmer. These observations are predictable properties of gases, and, as we explore in this chapter, they are described by the gas laws. The ideal gas law, which we will use almost exclusively in this section, is PV equals NRT, and it brings all the properties of the gases together. So let's go through what these symbols mean first of all. P is the pressure, all right, which we'll usually use atmospheres, as we'll talk about in a little bit. V is the volume of the gas, and V is usually liters. N is the quantity, which is moles, <clears throat> and we can convert grams to moles and molecules to moles. T is the temperature of the gas, and again, we'll use Kelvin. So as you pump up like a tire, <clears throat> all right, you're pressurizing it, your volume of the tire will change because the gas is, is changing. There will be a temperature if you add enough gas, it starts to freak out because you're changing the quantity of gas. So this is an example where lots of parts of gases are changing. <clears throat> and if you can figure out what this R is, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, you can use the ideal gas law really great. 
Now, in the organic chemistry lab, we use capital R to represent an alkyl group, a random alkyl group. This is a different use of R, okay? This is R for gases. We're gonna use capital R, and R is a lot in this um, Chem 222, but this is a completely different thing. So it doesn't mean put a methyl group in. <laughs> it's actually a number we'll talk about here. R is called the gas constant, and it's hyper useful when it comes to energy and gases. Now, what we're going to use in this chapter, chapter 9, is this value, 0 0.082057. And that's called the gas constant, universal gas constant sometimes people use. Uh, five sig figs is what I want you to use when you use R. Sometimes you can cheese out and use a little less, but trust me, try to use 0 0.082057. <clears throat> this is the value that's really useful when it comes to gases. Now, you can change liters atmospheres into joules, all right? This is a physics thing, but if you do that, you end up with a value of R, 8.3145. And we will use that in later chapters actually more than the 0 0.082057. So it's the same R, but instead of liters atmospheres, pressure times volume is a type of work, you can convert that into joules. 8.3145 is going to be really helpful. So punchline, many different values of R. All right, you can have R with calories or liters torres, blah, blah, blah. But these two on the top, we're going to use a lot. This chapter is going to be almost exclusively the top R. But in subsequent chapters, 8.3145 will be super useful to us, as we'll see. So that's the R right there. If you're using PV equals NRT, use 0 0.082057. Other R's, we'll maybe use this one down here. Questions? Okay, so this is a kind of question you might see. Let's say that you're an engineer and you want to know how much nitrogen is required to fill a small room with a volume of 960 cubic feet, or that many liters, to a pressure of 745 millimeters of mercury at roughly room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So this is like a room, length, width, height, all that kind of jazz. And remember, if you take the volume of a cube or a room, length times width times height, that's a type of a volume, all right? So cubic feet, you measure out feet times feet times feet, that's how they would get this 960 number. But you don't have to use cubic feet, which is really awkward. And a better unit for us will be this number, 2.70 times 10 to the fourth liters. And it's not too hard to convert cubic feet into liters. If you have Google, <laughs> you can translate, uh, get a conversion right away. So in this problem, we won't use the cubic feet, which are awkward, but we will use the liters. So we've got a volume, we've got a pressure, we've got a temperature, and we've got our good friend R. And the question is, how much nitrogen do we need? Well, when it comes to PV equals NRT, P is this number. All right, it's the millimeters of mercury. V is the liters value, the volume, all right? We're looking for N, how much it is. R is 0 0.082057. And T is the temperature in Kelvin. So we'll be translating that to Kelvin here pretty soon. So we basically want to solve for N. But when you use R, you have to make your units match liters for volume, atmospheres for pressure, Kelvin for temperature, and quantities in moles. So when you look at the values we have, we have a liter value, so we're good to go there, but we will need to translate the pressure into atmospheres. That's the 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere unit. And we'll also have to convert Celsius into Kelvin by adding by the 273 number. So we'll do a little unit conversion first, then we'll plug it into PV equals NRT, solve for N. Good to go. Questions before I start? All right, so 
So the first thing is you got to get the data into the right units. If you use R, you must use liters, atmospheres, Kelvin, and mole for your units. All right. And if in, if you're ever in question, convert to liters, atmospheres, Kelvins, and moles because it'll make you safe. All right. Sometimes, as we'll talk about in the problem set next week, you don't have to. But honestly, if you're ever in doubt, translate into them. So the volume was good as is. It's already in liters. I'm not going to use that lame cubic feet thing. Kelvin, though, has to happen. So 25 plus 273 would be 298. And we've got to turn our pressure into atmosphere. So we'll divide by 760.980 atmospheres would be the pressure here. So now we've got volume in liters, temperature in Kelvin, pressure in atmospheres. Now we've got everything in the right thing, so we can use R. So we'll use PV equals NRT, we'll solve for N, see how much quantity there is. So if you do that, the pressure, 0 0.980 atmospheres, the volume, 2.70 times 10 to the fourth. We divided both sides by RT to get those out, let N be by itself. So here's R, 0.082057. And the temperature again in Kelvin, 298 Kelvin. So this comes out to be 1.08 times 10 to the third moles of nitrogen. Woohoo, cool. Bosses, though, a lot of times don't know what a mole is from the creatures that run around the ground and make holes in my yard and stuff. So you've got to, a lot of times turn your moles into grams, or in our case, grams to kilograms. So let's review. How would you take this number, moles of nitrogen, and turn it into grams of nitrogen? Good. 6.022E23. Cool. No, no. No, it's okay. Avogadro's numbers, which we will use later, by the way, Clifford, 6.022 times 723 is useful when you want the number of molecules. All right? So if you want to know how many molecules were in here, we multiply by Avogadro's and do it. All right? But in this problem, we want mass, we want grams. Yeah. Multiply it by the um, molar mass of nitrogen. Excellent. We'll multiply by the molar mass of nitrogen. Now, nitrogen by itself, about 14 grams per mole. Is that the number we want to use? Six. Two. Ah, good. Have no fear of ice clear brew. We're back in the diatomics again. So in Chem 221, if you have, if you did, it's okay. In Chem 221, I told them about have no fear of ice clear brew. Those are the seven diatomics and the N is nitrogen. So what that means, yeah, you want to multiply by two, like she said, nitrogen is about 14 grams per nitrogen multiplied by two, we would multiply by about 28 grams per mole to get this number in grams of N2, okay? So, a lot of new concepts here coming down the pipeline, all stuff you've seen before, but you know, that was so last year. Anyway, so we talked about molar mass, the red numbers up here. The diatomics, have no fear of ice clear brew, the N here is the nitrogen. How many grams in a kilogram? Thousand, good. Thousand grams per kilogram. So you're going to get some number, big number, grams of N2. You would divide by a thousand, and that would give you the kilograms of N2. So again, if you haven't done this for a while, I recommend, you know, sometime after class, just making sure you go through it. Moles times molar mass and use the diatomic, 28 roughly grams per mole, and then thousand grams per kilogram. Good job. Any questions? All right. Why did we go from a two sig fig temperature to a three sig fig answer? Is it because we changed Celsius to Kelvin? Yes, yes. That's, well done. That's right. When you add and subtract, there's a different set of sig fig rules that you use. Now, 25 is a two sig fig number, but when you add 273 to it, it becomes 298 Kelvin, a number we'll hear about quite a bit. <clears throat> the doubtful digit tells how many sig figs are going to be in the final answer. 
So 25 stops at the one spot, 273 stops at the one spot. We want to call this at a number that stops at the one spot as well. So 25, when it's converted into Kelvin, becomes three sig figs. And that will be another thing that we're going to see in this area. How you go from a smaller sig figs to three sig figs. And at first, it doesn't make sense. But remember, adding and subtracting sig figs is different than multiplying and dividing. Okay. So in this problem, PV equals NRT, the king equation of this chapter. Pressure, we needed it in atmosphere. So we turned millimeters of mercury to atmospheres by dividing by 760. Volume is a volume in liters, we have it. Uh, so that wasn't a problem. N is what we're looking for, R.082057, and T is the Kelvin temperature. So even though tw Kelvin temperature, or excuse me, Celsius was two sig figs, we ended up with a three sig fig Kelvin temperature. And that's very common in these kind of problems. So at the end of the day, we ended up with a three sig fig answer because 25 Celsius becomes a three sig fig number, three sig figs. And then finally, we went from moles to grams using the molar mass of N2, a diatomic. So this number times 28 roughly grams per mole gives you the grams. And then 1,000 grams per kilogram, divide that by 1,000, 30.3 kilograms of N2. Ah, Any questions? All right, we'll do more of this on Friday. Have a great day. Remember, there is a fire drill today, supposedly at 2 p.m., just let me all know.